In a previous video, I discussed a mode of thinking when it comes to drawing in perspective, one which revolves around this idea that, as an artist, you are like the director of a movie scene. You are in control of the camera and as a result are responsible for the final image, your drawing. In this video, I'm going to build on this analogy and explain how to set up a scene, a drawing in perspective. So first of all, we need something to draw, a subject. Let's start with a, a simple box. We also need a camera to see the box and our drawing will be the image which that camera captures. I'm going to attempt to animate this, so I'm swapping out my detailed drawing of a camera here for a more simplified version. I need to decide where to place this camera, but before I do that, I'm going to add in a ground plane. This box will also be sat on the same ground plane. The ground plane is the surface on which the viewer was standing when looking at the subject, or in our case, let's think of it as the surface on which we set up our tripod for the camera, or where the cameraman is standing. So now that we have established a ground plane, we need to find a good location for our camera and also set a height for that camera. In doing this, we establish what is referred to as the station point. As the name suggests, this point must remain stationary. It represents the viewer, specifically the viewer's eye, or the camera in this case. Remember that as we change the height of the camera, we also change the camera level, which is the term we are using for the eye level. Imagine you are setting up a tripod, putting it down in a set location, establishing a station point, and then extending up the tripod also establishing a camera level. For this example, we'll place the camera in the middle here. Once we've done that, we also need to position the camera to be facing the subject. We can tilt and rotate the camera, and in doing this, we establish a line of sight, or let's say, a camera direction. Imagine a continuous line fixed to the camera, which moves along with it as you point it towards the subject. In fact, there's a term used when it comes to cameras called the optical axis, an imaginary line passing through the camera. This is the same as the line of sight. In this example, we'll keep our camera's direction parallel to the ground plane, and in doing this, we create a one or two points perspective image, a drawing in which all of the vertical lines remain vertical. To give an example, if we did raise the camera level and tilt it downwards, we would be dealing with a three points perspective image. The vertical lines are now converging to a vanishing point. But let's keep this simple for now and have our camera looking directly towards the subject parallel to the ground plane. Between the camera and the subject, there needs to be what's called a picture plane. This will always be fixed and perpendicular to the camera direction or line of sight. Again, imagine that continuous line. Where this line would intersect the picture plane would be our centre of vision or point of focus. It's the centre of where our camera is pointing. In regards to the picture plane, think of this as a translucent piece of glass upon which the subject behind it is being drawn. Its outline represents the border for our image. When it comes to positioning the picture plane, we only have the option to shift this back and forth. As you move it closer to the subject, you are essentially zooming in, and as you move it backwards towards the viewer, away from the subject, you are zooming out. It's like being stood looking at a, a brick wall. As you move towards that brick wall, you start to see less and less of it until you're right in front of it, and you can only see a little section directly in front of you. Now there's a question which arises here when thinking of this, and that is in relation to lenses, which is the last thing we need to do to set up our camera. We need to decide on what lens to use. As explained in the previous video, changing the focal length of a lens will change the angle of view, but it also changes the amount of magnification. In other words, it allows the photographer to zoom in or out on a subject without physically moving closer or further away. The picture plane moves back and forth as we adjust our focal length. The best way to imagine this is to look at how Blender, a 3D modeling program, illustrates the camera as you adjust the focal length. You can see how, as I increase it, it moves the front of this camera symbol forwards. 
And so to account for this change in the amount of magnification between lenses, you'll want to position your camera closer or further away from the subject depending on what lens you do use. In general, the larger your angle of view, the closer you'll want to position the camera to the subject and vice versa. So now you can start to see how we have a lot more options when dealing with cameras as opposed to a, a person who has a, a fixed angle of view, a person who has to walk closer to the subject in order to zoom in. A lens with a focal length of around 50mm is typically considered to be similar to that of the human eye, but we're not limited when it comes to choice here. We can choose any type of lens with varying focal lengths, but we must consider the effects it has on our drawing. Now we can emulate this in our drawing, that's the purpose of perspective. In our example and mode of thinking, we're imagining a camera. So I'm going to use a 35mm lens, which has an angle of view of around 60 degrees. Scott Robertson in his How to Draw book mentions that a lens of this type is optimal as it creates an acceptable amount of distortion. Distortion which occurs when we are outside our angle of view. Now as I've been explaining all of this, I've been showing you what this setup looks like from a, let's say, spectator's point of view. And that's because not only is it easier to understand what's going on, it's also useful to visualise a setup like this when drawing. But of course we need to also know how all of this applies and translates into a drawing. And as I said, our drawing will be the camera's view. A view which I will produce on some paper. So keeping in mind the setup we have here, let's start by drawing in the horizon line, our camera level. The camera is looking directly at the box in front and so for this example, I'll place my centre of vision point directly in the middle. This point is in the middle of the picture plane and so I can also outline that. And this can be any size you want, think of it as the border of your drawing. So now we need to set a location for our camera by establishing a station point. Now looking at this spectator's view of what we are translating over onto paper, you might be wondering how do you even take a point in a three dimensional space like this and project it onto a two dimensional surface? Well, how we do that is simple. We take the distance from the station point to the picture plane and swing this down so that this point is on that same plane. Now there's no need to be too accurate when it comes to judging this distance in your drawing, but there are a few things to consider. Here I'll draw a vertical line down from my centre of vision point. This line represents the line of sight or camera direction. And at the end of this, I'll add the station point. For this example, I want to keep this point on my paper, but when it comes to deciding where to place this point, I'm essentially altering how far away my camera is located from the subject, which obviously changes how the subject appears. I'll show you an example of that later, for now let's just keep it here and move on to the next step, which is deciding on what lens to use. As mentioned a moment ago, I'm going to use a 35mm lens with an angle of view of around 60 degrees. To represent this in our drawing, we need to set up our cone of vision. And to do this, if you're drawing by hand like I am, you'll need a protractor. Remember, this station point is where our camera is located and so from this point, I'm going to extend across two lines, each of them at 30 degrees. 30 plus 30 equals 60. This gives me an angle of view at 60 degrees. If I was using a lens with a 90 degree angle of view, I'd draw each of these lines at 45 degrees. Now where these lines cross this line, the horizon line or camera level, this gives me the extents for my circle, the base of the cone. So I can now take a compass and draw in a circle from my centre of vision point, which will obviously always be in the centre of the cone, and have this cross these points like so. We've now set up a 60 degree cone of vision, emulating a 35mm lens. Now there's a few things I want to discuss, but to give a better example, I'm going to firstly draw in the box, because at this stage we have set up our camera, now we just need something to capture. If you're watching this video, I assume you are already familiar with vanishing points. 
you'll know that in order to draw a box like this, you need to position two vanishing points on the horizon line. Now when it comes to positioning them, we also have a choice. We can decide on the angle at which we want to view this box by positioning the vanishing points correctly. We can rotate this box. For example, in our spectator's view, the box is shown to be on an angle. We can take a box like this, if we are looking at it from this direction, and rotate it around in many ways on any axis. Let's look at this on a top-down view and rotate it on its z-axis. Again, if we are looking at it in this direction, right now it's facing us, but let's rotate it 45 degrees. Now we see one of its edges. We know that we are dealing with a box with faces at 90 degrees. If I extend these lines, each of these are at 45 degrees. 45 plus 45 equals 90. Let's go back and instead rotate this, let's say 15 degrees. Now we still see two of its faces, but more of one than the other. This line is at 15 degrees, and this line is at, well, 90 take away 15 is 75, so 75 degrees. Let's rotate the box 30 degrees. Now we can see a little more of both faces. This line is at 30 degrees, which means this line must be at 60 degrees. In knowing these angles of rotation, we have an idea of how the subject, in this case a box, will appear in our drawing, because we can also set up our vanishing points to be at the same angle. Also, as mentioned in Scott Robertson's How to Draw book, the examples that I have just shown are some common combinations. 45, 45, 75, 15, and 60, 30, but you're really not limited when it comes to deciding on what angle you want to show the subject on, as long as both values total to 90 degrees. So now we are back to this drawing here, and to apply what we've just looked at to set up our vanishing points, we firstly need to decide on an angle. It looks like the box on the spectator's view is around 60-30, so I'll go with that. We also set up our vanishing points from the station point, seeing as this is where our camera is positioned. I'll draw a line from this point at 30 degrees, and then at the other side, a line at 70 degrees. Both of these total to 90, and where these cross the horizon line is where both the left and the right vanishing points will be. Now that I have this, I can draw in my box like so. Also, because we are dealing with vanishing points at 90 degrees, we can also find what is referred to as the diagonal vanishing point, a vanishing point at 45 degrees from the station point. This is helpful when drawing boxes like this because, as you can see here, instead of guessing, you can accurately locate the opposite corner, resulting in a perfectly square plane in perspective. It's also useful when it comes to constructing grids. I've now finished drawing in this box. A box which has been accurately rotated on an angle of my choice, captured by a camera at a set level through a lens with a 35mm focal length, resulting in a 60 degree angle of view, so you have control, going back to my director analogy. Now, as I said, there's a, a few things I want to discuss relating to the things we can control and the effect it has on a drawing. First of all, you might look at this cone of vision and think, why is it so small? That's not a, a very big drawing area. Now, if you work digitally, then I guess one solution would be to simply scale this up, but if you are drawing on paper, like myself, then what can you do? Well, it goes back to what we have learned. In this example, I've deliberately kept my station point on the paper here, so you can see this entire setup, but remember, this point represents how far away the camera is from the subject, so if I was to move this closer towards the centre of focus without changing my angle of view, where these lines intersect with the horizon line, these points would gradually get closer together, creating a smaller circle. Likewise, if I was to move this station point further away, these points would move further away, and the circle would increase in size. Now, when I had set this up, I began by establishing my station point first, the position of my camera, and then once I decided on a lens to use, that dictated my angle of view, and in turn, the size of my cone of vision here. 
but alternatively, we can start by drawing in the circle our cone of vision at any size we want, meaning we can have this cover most of the picture plane, and then we can establish the station point. This is a lot easier to do if you are working digitally, as you can easily scale this up to any size. There are a lot of inconveniences, let's say, when doing this on paper like I do. And again, it's all to do with scale. I usually set this up, find my vanishing points. You can even create a grid at this stage to make it easier. That's something we'll be looking at in a later video. But you'll often find that you do need to scale this up once you have set this up in order to draw at a suitable scale. For example, here on screen, I've set up a drawing using three types of lenses. A wide angle lens, a standard lens, and a telephoto lens. Pay attention to the position of the station point and how this moves further away as we reduce the angle of view. Because we also set up our vanishing points from the station point, you can see how these are also further away from each other. Now look at the effect that this has on my drawing. The further away the vanishing points, the further your lines need to travel to meet them. This all makes sense when you consider the lens we are using for each of these. Remember that we are emulating a camera. Okay, so it looks like Boxman is a little confused. We have covered a lot in this video, but what I'm going to do at the end here is share with you a drawing which I created for a tutorial on my Patreon page. This is a new vehicle for Boxman, so that should cheer him up, but the reason I wanted to share this with you is because I had drawn this using a wide angle lens with an angle of view of 90 degrees. You can see how the drawing is a lot more dynamic in comparison to drawings that are created using lenses with a larger focal length. Oh, and you might have noticed that I also created a perspective grid, which is useful, especially when using a lens with a smaller angle of view, because remember, those vanishing points are often further away from your picture plane. So, does all of this make sense? Hmm, it looks like Boxman is still confused, but at least he has a new car. Anyways, I'm going to end this one here. It's been a, a long one, but I hope it's been useful. I will be making a study document for Patreon based on this video. These are essentially tutorials on paper, and as mentioned earlier, I do have a step-by-step -step drawing tutorial for the drawing that I've just shown you. If that sounds like something you are interested in, then be sure to have a look, and with that being said, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video.